Great, so nice to see you again. It's been bloody ages uh, and lots and lots of things have happened since we last spoke. Um, how are you, my friend? I'm good, I'm good. I, I wasn't good and now I am good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's something about Latin American people and the depth of community that does not exist in the United States. And mm -hmm. like what happens when we build deep trust that I just find so beautiful and so nourishing. And some of that happened this week. Mm, lovely. Yeah, no, th th it's a good reminder that there are still so many places where people live in different reality spaces and where some of the ancient and soon to be new ways um, are actually still in the fabric. And and so, yeah, for people coming from North America, for, from our sort of hyper-industrialized um, cultures, it can be amazing to, to connect with life's regenerative fabric that is actually still, every, I mean, it still exists in North America too, but, but less so than in rural communities in most parts of the world. So I'm so glad that, because I remember we had a conversation where, where that was a possibility in Costa Rica was the, the first attempt to find, find, a, find a place um, to, to really unfold your agency in place. And um, so I'm just so happy to to see how you're grounding in Barichara. Um, what yeah, it's, I mean, it's just incredible because Barichara is a national monument. The whole town is designated in a way that preserves the handcrafts because all of the construction in the town, I mean, it's, it's not indigenous, it's uh, 18th century Spanish colonial construction, mm -hmm. but it's still mud packed walls hand carved stone floors, you know, the, the local materials from the wood, from the forest here for the roofs. And so there's just like the idea that you don't need power tools and actually where would you even plug them in? You know, you have this guy with a metal bar and a chisel and a hammer and he's like building the whole house mm. because the people here still know how to do that. Mm. And um, it's, it's really refreshing. So is the place actually recognized in that sense? Um, so, so it has been nominated a national treasure? Yeah. Sometime in the early 90s, mm -hmm. they designated it as, you know, Patrimonio Nacional. Okay. Um, so there are restrictions on its development. And it's really designated for, like, tourism purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a way that, like, the Ministry of Culture invests a lot in um, providing funding for you know, what they call your tajeres, you know, these workplaces for natural fibers, for stonework, um, for uh, um, for paper, for textile weaving. It's all supported by the Ministry of Culture of Colombia as part of the national patrimony. And so um, that's why this town is called the most beautiful town in Colombia. There are other towns yeah. that would be just as beautiful if they didn't have this ugly concrete development for their buildings, you know, that's mixed in with the the Spanish villas. And so, uh, you know, like if you look at the floor, mm -hmm. you know, that's all hand carved. Yeah, beautiful. And laid out by hand. And, and the whole town is like that. So yeah, um, every time I see any of your pictures, I kind of go, Christopher Alexander would have just loved it. <laughs> like, yeah. It has that kind of multi-fractal pattern of natural form expressing itself rather than this sort of weird um, straight line thing that brutalist architecture has <laughs> imposed on the world. <laughs> yeah, like there's a town nearby called Kuriti, and they are famous for their their fike, which is a type of agave plant. And like this, this is a, a weaving pattern of the indigenous people here. And it's fike is on the, the broad leaves of this agave plant. And it's really strong. It's flexible, but it retains its shape. So mm -hmm. you, know, you put something heavy in it, it expands, but then it retracts again. And while cotton is from this region, this is a much stronger material. Right. And um, and Kurati is, is known for its, its fike. So it's really beautiful textiles. But the town is not a national monument, and half of the town is like Barichara, and half of the town is ugly, cheap concrete and steel construction, and and it just sort of destroys the beauty of the town as a as a cohesive whole, 
to have this mixed pattern of aesthetics. So the national um, monument status mm. has really been fundamental to Barichara being preserved since mm. the 1990s. Uh, so it's it's one of those interesting, you know, the power of the state mm -hmm. uh, doing something that is deeply bioregional, but maybe somewhat accidental. Yeah, it's hard to know how. It's fascinating. Like, there's a, there's an echo with the the agave plant and the the fiber. I mean. The, the, there's a certain type of shoe that is quite popular all around the Mediterranean, but it actually originated here in this area, which is espandrilos. They're basically agave fiber um, soles with a stitched linen top, easy to wear in the summer instead of flip-flops, which are full of plastic. Yeah? And, and they're also made in exactly from that same fiber. And, and just today I was in this wonderful, spent the morning in a lovely place and an old um now run by the government um kind of old estate i would say the like a, a big farm with a manor house and stuff which has been converted into the museum of the tramontana and and we were i was invited to speak to this group of international heirloom weavers people from india from from colombia a number of them um it, Every continent, including a guy who built stations on the Antarctica, but but for some reason Africa wasn't represented. But um, it was just a wonderful morning to connect with these people who, through fiber, were woven into the the biomaterial context of their region, and how textile is really the the first pre-written word. The first storytelling is how we wove textiles and the patterns and textiles tell stories of how we are connected, and it, it's it's just I, I find more and more that this um, that I think the first time we met in person was at this conference where Ashoka kind of jumped onto the um, the metaphor like yeah. and yeah. and um, there is such power in remembering the importance of weaving on all levels, whether it's from textiles to what what you're doing um, bioregionally of not like, hi, I've just showed up in Barichara and um, I have a great idea, follow me, but, but of weaving those people together who've actually been living in that landscape and connected to it for a long time and, and, and making them visible to each other, celebrating for what they're doing, giving them visibility, into a more international sphere and and through that access to funding and so on and um yeah it must have been a really tough journey because when you do that kind of stuff not everybody says thank you that's really nice of you I, so, some people um I, I understand somebody got really uppity with you recently how how is this panned out and how do you maneuver these yeah when 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 suddenly things flare up and well Maybe I'll start with, uh, so Barichara is, is special for several reasons. One reason is that um, the Colombian president who is the most similar to Abraham Lincoln in the United States, mostly self-taught, amazing orator, very persuasive. Um, there's a, um, a man named Aki Leopara, who is from Barichara. And unlike Abraham Lincoln, who, um, tried to keep the union together and stop the separation of the North from the South in the United States. Mm -hmm. Haki Leopada was like, we today we'd call him a bioregionalist, but really in Colombia, they don't have states, they have departments, you know, departamentos, and, you know, territories, territorial governments. And Haki Leopada was a, was a strong advocate for territorial autonomy within the nation state system. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in the U.S. context, you'd be more for states' rights than federal rights in that way of thinking. And um, also the independence movement against the Spanish crown for all of South America started in Barichara. Oh, wow. and, uh, yeah. and then I recently learned from a woman who works a lot with, um, with Andy and Cosmovisions through theater and, um, and other kinds of performance arts storytelling is that the first person to challenge the Catholic indoctrination in education in Colombia was also from Barichara. So this independence movement and its various expressions 
is anchored here, and the indigenous people were one of the fiercest resistances to the conquistadors. And so there's this, this sort of recurring pattern of this place. It's relatively isolated within a very dense canyon network where the Andes have three parallel mountain ranges. So it's very difficult to enter without petroleum, mm -hmm. you know, without paved roads and, uh, and gasoline. It's very difficult to get in here. And, um, and it's also a nexus of Camino Real, you know, these uh, footpaths between the Tirona civilization to the north, which is the Tirona and the Kogi people today, mm -hmm. and the Muisca civilization to the south, which is based in Bogota and had a trade network all the way down to the Quechua people, you know, through Ecuador, like this trade network across the Andes. And the Guane people of this region were, you know, the holders of these, um, these stone paths, these, these footpaths through the Northern Andes, through the mountains, in this most dense place of canyons. And so it's just really interesting to hold these different layers of why is there such a strong sense of autonomy here? But one of the consequences of that, the negative side is xenophobia. Mm. We don't trust outsiders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very clan-based, similar to Scotland or Ireland in its own way. And so during the, the period of violence in the last century, the most violent town in all of Colombia during the violence was the town of Villanueva, which as the name suggests, the new village, Mm -hmm. was formed because they separated from Barichara. They're 10 kilometers away. And what happened was there was an election where the, the here in Colombia, liberals means those who want liberation from the Spanish crown and conservative means those who wanted to side with the aristocracy mm -hmm. you know, in some version or another. And so um, there was an election in Barichara and it was like 95% liberal. So the conservatives left Barichara and formed Vienna Wave at 10 kilometers away. And then they had an election and one person voted liberal and everyone in the town knew who it was and they kicked that person out. And then for the next 40 years, there was this clan-based violence, family to family and liberal versus conservative. That was the most violent violence in the period of violence in Congo. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, this sort of clan-based um, suspicion is deeply seated here. And yet they also created their own peace. They constructed their own peace process. It was a local priest who started doing these cultural week activities. People were so tired of the violence, they just needed to have parties. Because everyone, was, you know, you could just walk on the street, someone would shoot you. Like it was, it was really, really bad. And it was um, completely anarchistic. You know, there was no, uh, like there was no police. No one went to jail. The nation state was, was you know, Bogota is really far away. Um, and so uh, people just got tired of being scared that they were gonna be killed by their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they started a process of constructing peace. But this has consequences for me, white skin from the North, gringo accent. My Spanish wasn't very good when I got here. So I've been accused of satanic worship, of indoctrinating children, of being a drug dealer all kinds of interesting things that I now are, I know they're just, they're like tropes of this culture that they project on outsiders. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, you don't get welcomed into the community until you've been accused of being a bad person at some point along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, I don't take it nearly as personally as I did in the beginning. <laughs> um, so a lot of it, it turns out is that being hardworking, salt of the earth kind of campesinos, what they care about is is what you do, not what you say. Mm -hmm. Exactly, same here. Yeah. You know, so um, when when people started seeing me, you know, walking through the town, covered with mud, <laughs> um, I just come out of the rain, maybe carrying a pickaxe, and uh, they could just tell that I wasn't like other outsiders that came here and taught, you know, to tell people what to do. I didn't even explain what I was doing. I was just doing it. And um, and then people go and look at it and it worked. And it's a really deep pragmatism. Not that different from where I grew up in Missouri, actually. Mm -hmm. Deep suspicion of intellectuals and elites. And what they really care about is, you know, do you do what you say and does it work? 
And this, this is really interesting that that kind of reference to your home area, because I I get this every time here on Mallorca when something happens that is very kind of typically Mallorcan, and I kind of go, oh yeah, that's just again this kind of closed, we are we and they are they and all all those kind of st things, and then I just now I have this this mental habit of asking myself what would happen in Bavaria in rural Bavaria like I, I'm from Munich. Uh -huh. Um, and it would be exactly the same. It's 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 simply like close knit, inward looking, small rural communities have 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 a different way of being suspicious of, uh, particularly when there's a history of, of of violence. I mean, here on Mallorca, it's pretty much anybody around the Mediterranean at some point in the last three thousand years has um, come and robbed people off the beaches and and plundered the island. Uh, so. Um, no surprise that trust has to be earned. Like I actually had a local here because I did do a little bit of this, not a kind of, here's the German guy who's going to tell you what to do with your island, but I did ask questions along the lines of what would a sustainable Mallorca look like? What would kind of transformation on the island scale really mean for us? And and and, and what would its advantages be? That was kind of stuff that I tried to, introduced into the public discourse when I first arrived here through public speaking and so on. And I, I remember a, a local friend saying, it's it's nice that you give these talks, but I feel you, you're you going to burn out if you keep on this path. Just live, do your thing, earn your money. And if you're still here in 10 years time, they'll start to listen to you. And in the meantime, like serve yourself, serve your community, serve life. Don't wear yourself out in trying to do it now. Uh, and it, it is really true that the the difference that having now have a, like I have a 12 year record here on the island, means that uh, people just begin to view me differently because I'm sure Barichara also has a lot of transient population, people that kind of drop out into Barichara for a short period of their life, a year or three, and then they go back to America or something. Uh -huh. Yeah, Barichara is such a nice place that people come here and you know, wealth, like the wealthiest families in Colombia all own houses. About 40% of the houses in the town are owned by five or six families. Because, you know, Colombia has very extreme land distribution. Mm -hmm. It's one of the worst in Latin America for the percentage of the population that owns the land even though in the constitutional change that happened in 1993, the territorial lands were given back to indigenous people. So 24% of the land area of the country is officially owned by the tribes. And yet the worst violence, you know, the assassinations of environmental leaders and um, the guerrilla warfare against um, indigenous leaders is in those indigenous lands. You know, it's it's legally a reality, but it's not culturally a reality. Mm -hmm. But um, Bari Chara is this island of prosperity and peace. And so it's a really nice place for a rich family to, you know, that that trust fund baby type of, you know, young adult to come and have family money to build a hotel, like a nice luxury hotel, and then invite their friends to come on vacation. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the culture here now. Mm -hmm. It's all mixed in. Yeah, that's, and, it's, it's another yeah. resonance with Mallorca. I mean, Mallorca has that weird dose of ultra privilege, like of, of, of billionaires, like resident billionaires, um, I think 11 or 12 of them uh, on, on an island of less than a million um, people. So fascinating. I didn't know that about Barachar. Yeah, and what's interesting is when Willem Ferwerda of Common Land, when he came here, you know, we were having a lot of conversations about how Barichara could become another landscape of the Common Land Network. And, and he told me, one of the things they look for is relative stability and prosperity mm -hmm. because they're creating demonstration sites for 20 years. Yeah. And if it's too unstable, it's like, yes, Uganda needs this model, but you don't prototype the model in Uganda mm -hmm. because they need to demonstrate it for the long term. And you know, with the experience that Willem has as, you know, former director of the IUCN and doing biodiversity conservation work, what matters is the long-term presence of the conservation project. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you run out of funding for your project, then the bulldozers come in to cut down the forest. And that was his experience doing conservation work. And part of his motivation to uh, to look at different, you know, what he later realized were regenerative economic models in, in his own development. And so while some people would say, what you're doing in Barichara can't easily be replicated in other parts of Colombia, they're absolutely right. But what we can demonstrate in terms of inspiration, what we can demonstrate in just having people come and experience it is because of its prosperity and stability. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, you know, an interesting validation of um, See, the, the, the outliers of particular kinds can also be particular kinds of models. It's fascinating because I, I mean, I've known Willem since um, he was here on Mallorca with a, with his family um, in 2017, uh, just when my daughter was, was born, actually. And um, at the end of the holidays, which was maybe me being eight days into being a dad, the very first human contact I had after that amazing thing where it was just Alice, Lucia, and me, and my mom at, at one point, um, was meeting with Willem and his wife in a in a little um, bar down the road from where we were living, and um, so and then I, I met him through another group which is called Ecosystems Restoration or Regeneration, actually, um, that is bringing large doer foundations and donor foundations together for landscape level change, and and he's kind of one of the doer foundations in there um, in terms of th their work, and since then I've also a number of times tried to connect common land with what's going on here in Mallorca. And the first time around, it didn't work that well. The second time it's it's now landed. Common land is involved in a, in a regional project here on, on Mallorca and through an organization that, that I've supported for the last 10 years called Save the Med. And there's the beginning of a sort of um, free alliance, again, again, typical island sort of vignette here. Um, bringing a group of people together and there's just eight or nine organizations and uh, on the third meeting there's a typical local voice there's this uh, I hope nobody feels offended by this but I don't feel comfortable we keep calling this an alliance just so I feel more comfortable could we call it a pre-alliance <laughs> I mean brilliant like beautifully stated where he was at but it also shows you where people are it's like, don't, don't be committal about doing stuff together. <laughs> that would be a bit too much. But, <laughs> but, but, but where, I'm, where I'm going with this, where, which I think is quite interesting in terms of both of our like trajectories and, and, and theories of change and, and, and engagement in, the, in this space of bioregional regeneration, is precisely something that keeps coming up with the guys from Common Land. Uh, like I'm honestly, I'm somewhat disappointed because I had such a good personal relationship with Willem. And I kind of really wanted this not to be another landscape that common land is working in. Like I'm not interested in that. I wanted this to be a space for core learning where Willem would come because he'd really love this particular case. And we kind of connected over our shared love for Mallorca and the Balearics and over shared people that we know here and the potential here in terms of, because there's a lot of very big wealth from all over the world having second homes in the Balearics. Um, and and right now it's to my mind it's a little bit too much managed by some brilliant young people in common land, but 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 I don't feel like I feel that it's exactly showing me the tension, and this is where I'm going with this, between how do we is there I'm going to show you how to blueprints of Here's a recipe, do this, follow pro-social and this, that, and the other, and then you can all do it. Is it replicable? And, and then you were kind of alluding to this in a number of ways. It's, it's not an either or. Like there is pattern, process, attitude, um, humility. Um, there is something that is replicable, but it's not a give me the 10 steps off and do this first, do this second, because that's where it gets, like it also loses the buy-in. I'm, I'm noticing it in this common land example. My energy is dropping with that project because I'm beginning to feel one in many. It's precisely the 
potential, the dynamism of the specificity of a particular place and particular people with a particular culture, the humility or the interest, even the way that you are now speaking of the history of that place and how it came to be the indigenous nested network along the, the, the Andes, that's exactly the story of place that we need to attune to before we can even have the presumption of doing anything in a place. And I'm just kind of going, as an Ellie from Common Land, you jet in here for two days, you listen to a few locals who you now think are the island, but they're just eight organizations of the 20 or 25 or 30 that we in the minimum need to bring together to 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 weave functional ecosystem. And so how, how do you dance with because I, I hear you a lot still working with this educational idea of we're going to show you or collectively explore bioregional regeneration at planetary scale. And of course, we're both aligned that it's a scaling out. It's not a scaling up. It's a but, but it's it's that dance that we had ever since Stuart Cohen and and so on was trying to get us together to work at at Capital Institute um, around this. Is it that we need a big network where all these communities and bioregional activities locally spend ages doing what we're doing right now, sitting in a virtual space and 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 talking about stuff, or is it that we actually need the energy on the ground doing stuff? And and what's yeah. the balance? so over to you. After that, well, you just, I mean, I just love the question you just ended with because I, I would say, is it because I'm older? Because I'm more experienced in this specifically? Is it because I'm a father? You know, and I'm just, you know, experiencing how much I do not try to control in my child. I, you know, wherever it comes from, I'm increasingly annoyed by any presumption that people can talk online about making this work. And that, you know, so I want to, <laughs> so I want to uh, hear you say that. Uh, yeah, so I want to, I want to share a couple of stories <laughs> because what you know, one thing that has happened in the last six months is, and we're about to do it again um, in the Colorado Basin in two weeks, is we're starting, like, I'm starting a particular way of traveling. Uh, and being invited into landscapes. When I bring in my earth systems perspective, so I can, like when we went to Southern Ontario uh, around the greater Takaranto bioregion in Toronto, uh, to look at the Great Lakes and then to look at the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Niagara Escarpment, these particular landforms that create such incredible abundance of water around Lake Ontario. And, um, and like, we're about to do it again in the Colorado Basin, of um, how local people often do not see the embeddedness of their place as a story. Mm -hmm. Like the people of Toronto don't see the Great Lakes, or like the Algonquin people that trickle all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico through the Mississippi Basin and all the canoes. You know, like there's this nestedness that actually is a truly continental scale. Um, that uh, there's something really incredible about the people who are so devoted to their place, and basically you cannot kill their passion for it, even though many attempts have been made. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's actually a, a trial of um, spiritual struggle. Mm -hmm. And so our friends in um, the Toronto area, Brian and Susan, who have an organization called The Legacy Project, they've spent 20 years trying to do transformational systems change. They're brilliant people, but it's not their brilliant that makes them special. It's their devotion that makes them special. That they're still doing it after 20 years of mostly failure, which doesn't mean that nothing's worked. It's just they haven't achieved transformation when that's what they're trying to do. But they love their place so much. They know their place so well. You know, they're right in the middle of this unique landform called the Oak Ridges Moraine, which is like this... 150 kilometer east to west and 30 to 40 kilometer north to south, basically a giant gravel pit made by the ice, by the ice sheets. Mm -hmm. That is the birthplace of 69 rivers. Because it's between Lake Huron and Lake Ontario. And there's like there's no geologic feature like that anywhere else on the planet. But if you're in it, it's just like flat open Ontario. It's sort of boring. You know, if you don't know what it is, it's sort of boring. 
it's just big open space that's really cold for half the year. Mm -hmm. um, even though the Algonquin people, you know, have a presence there for at least 14,000 years. And, you know, there's, there's a real history, but as settler culture, it's mostly invisible. But, um, but what we're finding is igniting that story of place and creating a context in which dialogue arises. Like, why do you love living here? You know, why do you, you're in Southern Ontario. Why do you love living here? Uh, okay, you're in, we went to the to Cleveland, the Cuyahoga River, you know, the river that famously started on fire like 14 times in 1967. Yeah. Why do people love Cleveland so much? Because people in Cleveland really love Cleveland. And, um, and igniting that story. And then using online supports to bring shared language. And I think that is what common land does best is it's shared language. Yeah, it's the flow returns, the three zones, you know. Important that kind of 25 years. Like the, the, the way the three work, work together is a stroke of genius of Willem because he, he basically reworded in much more palpable language for a wider range of people that core permaculture design principles in, 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 in a essentialization with these four returns where ultimately he's saying exactly what you're just saying. You need to create the story. You need to create the return of inspiration first that will then drive activity in ecological regeneration that both of those together are already a mechanism of creating social regeneration. And if you do that with enough patience to understand that this takes 25 years, both in terms of ecological systems and social systems change, then within five or six years, you then begin to see the economic local multipliers and you then get the fourth return, local, healthy, regenerative economic return. Um, yeah, but, exactly. And, but it's the 25 years that like the guts that he had when he first started out with Pondland to go to funders. And when they said to him, well, this sounds like a really nice plan. We'll fund you for the next year or two, and then we'll see whether we commit. He would just, say, even if they offered him big money, he would basically say, we're only in, uh, interested in funders who are with us for the next 20 years. Uh, and and, and it, because ecological systems for to heal needs that time scale. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't want to in, interrupt you. No, no. I think that brings beautiful clarity. The difference between funding process and funding project was his big lesson at the IUCN. Like right. you have this great conservation project, but once the funding runs out, you know, cue the bulldozers, cue the chainsaws mm -hmm. um, because some other financial interest comes in and he just was tired of being heartbroken by the destruction of beautiful ecosystems because no one was funding process. That was, I remember having some really good conversations with him about that when he was here. Another thing that I, I wanna bring into this to step away from the common land model for a moment and look at another pattern language is when I learned from Dana Meadows about that, that discovery of the fundamental role of bioregional learning centers. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's just how they're fundamental, they're fundamental. And by the way, I think that's something common land is missing, mm -hmm. is that they don't, they, they talk about learning ecosystems, but more through the language of Theory U and Presence Institute, which is not bad, it's good, but it's incomplete. But if you start a conversation about bioregional learning centers, and you take just a few minutes, you don't even need much time, just a few minutes to start to say, a bioregional learning center is reconstructing the cultural history, the story of place, the ecological context. And then you have a local ecologist or an environmental educator or someone who does decolonization or um, reclamation of indigenous rights, which, whichever lens, they get it. They get it and they go, oh, I see how we have elements of a bioregional center, but we don't have a coherent ecosystem that we could call a bioregional learning center. And it creates very practical interventions for a local person who knows their landscape really well. Actually, it, it goes even further than that. And that's an insight through, that I've had in the last year and a half with this process on Mallorca that I'm very careful not to say that has anything to do with my activity. <laughs> the, the normal 
and in, in common land is falling or, or the, at least the project here at the moment seems to be falling into this if you build an alliance of things their their current theory of change still goes very much into and then once we've done a theory you and invested a little bit in people meeting each other seeing them in the system seeing each other in the local place all important work eh? um then we need to have like the smallest feasible project to give the people confidence that they can do stuff together and stuff. And, and that goes back into this project-based stuff. Eh? And I'm realizing that in some cultures, maybe not everywhere where they're working, but in a in a in a sort of not low but slow trust culture, eh? um, like we have here and you seem to have where, where, where you are. Um, the bioregional learning is the Aikido move that puts the dress me slowly, I'm in a hurry kind of thing onto the table and says, we don't even know each other yet. We know that you work with the local grandmothers and you work with how to um, teach children and you work with endangered species and you work with the local water treatment um, association. We all care for this place, but we need to first see how important each of our role is in this wider system. So we need to go on a bioregional learning journey of really teaching each other to fall in love with the uniqueness, the detail, the fractal detail of everything in this bioregion. And, and by funding that, and this is what I'm trying to, to get people to do here in Mallorca, is to say, if we, if we battle it out between the organization who are currently in the pre-alliance to say which project is going to be the one that, and who's going to get what, which part of the pie once we get funding, then we're in the same old pattern as, as before. Uh, everybody's thinking of their organization and how it can get a benefit by collaborating. But it's dissolving these organizational patterns of thinking and creating the will bioregionally to really want to heal the place together and to really see that it's not a it's already going on we just need to unveil what what is already going on and, and activate it more and and i think that it's precisely the bioregional learning of of saying if we could fund people from different walks of life and different organizations in a given territory. And by, by fund, I mean, if they come from small NGOs and you want them to invest five or six days a month in this learning journey, then fund that NGO for their time so they don't have to lose their human power for whatever they're already doing that is good. And ideally fund the organization for sending somebody to join that. And you have to be flexible. Some organizations might just be happy to have somebody learning in that and be able to be a partner in it. Like the local government planning office could second somebody to say, join this learning journey. But what you would actually do by, by creating these two year processes of, of um, really grounding in a territory and learning of other things that are possible in other parts of the world, but always with the question, is that meaningful to us and how could it serve? Would it serve and how does it connect to us? And always in this, let's not home in on projects, not home in on, on deliverables. Let's home in on the collective learning, the bit relationship building and the, the learning about this place, but also the falling in love with this place. Because that, I mean, this is what, well, I'm sure you have this with, with Barichara. As you spend more time in that place and as you really learn it, it opens up in, so many news ways like i i notice now that i walk i've been here for 12 years but now i walk through the the landscape in a way that the trees speak to me about who they are and why they're there and in what association they are um five years ago they wouldn't have done that i hadn't given the attention to that learning and so yeah like i well, what do you think about this 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 notion of of really slowing it down to invite all these people that currently kind of are still projecting onto you and 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 so on into simply a process of let's really fall in love with this place um, and and learn about it just briefly because it came to mind earlier when you were speaking is you know Patrick Geddes who 
yeah, yeah. The, 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 the notion of um, think globally, act locally. Um, the Outlook Tower in Edinburgh is also a kind of, it's like a public education bioregional learning center that, and I mean, imagine this was 120 years ago when he developed this, like walking into the ground floor, seeing the world, and then you walk up one stair, and then you see Europe, and then you walk up another staircase, and you see Great Britain, and then another one, Scotland, and then you're on the top, and you see the camera obscura showing you all of Edinburgh. And in a relatively light way, but telling you the story of place. And before you knew it, when you walk back down, you've gone from the global to the local, and on your way out to the local, you've gone past the global again. And suddenly in your body, you have a nested wholeness awareness. And this was open to anybody in Edinburgh in 1898 or something like that. Yeah. So um, these processes are so important. How do we get people into like universities, museums, in places to celebrate the story of place again? Uh, I, I wanna um, touch on something really interesting about the first piece of land that we bought with donations, which is called Orihan del Agua. And it's at the top of the ridge line that is above Barichara. So Barichara is at the bottom and then you, um, you walk on a, on a Camino Real, so there's a footpath that goes for about five and a half or six kilometers, and you arrive at the very top of the ridgeline, and that's where that land is, and it's a tributary that's one of the branches of the Barichara River, but also it's um, the ridgeline itself is an aquifer system, and so the, the groundwater that has provided water to Barichara since time immemorial mm -hmm. has been this, this groundwater support. And that's why we call it Orihan del Agua, is it's the origin of water at the top of um, a groundwater and a surface water system, as well as the, the cloud feedbacks for bringing the moisture. And what's powerful about this place is it's a little bit more than an hour to walk. It's fairly steep in the first half hour, and then relatively fine, you sort of hike up to the ridgeline, which is the steep part, and then the ridgeline gradually increases, but it's nearly flat, so the rest of it's fairly fairly casual. But from up there, you're looking down onto the plateau and into the drainage of the Barichara River on one side and into a much deeper canyon into the Chicamocha River on your other side. And so you're above and looking out into the territory. So for me, the most powerful way to relate to that 3.2 hectare piece of land, it's, it's fairly small, mm -hmm. six acres, not very much. So you have no way of knowing the importance of that land unless you walk to it. Because mm -hmm. if you walk to it, you experience with your body the way that that little place is situated in its larger landscape. And so I would notice when people came to Barichara to volunteer or to learn, there were very few people who actually wanted to walk to Oriental Agua. Mm -hmm. And most people wanted to take a tuk-tuk or find some other way to get there because they found they just wanted to be there. And for me, the difference was profound. Mm. To walk to that land is to experience the landscape. It's a bioregional walk. Mm. And there are very interesting things like, we have a unique ecosystem on earth because it's a tropical dry forest, which is not unique. There are many tropical dry forests, but we have a high Andes tropical dry forest. All that that means, high Andes, is that it's on a plateau, it's about 1400 meters. Whereas oftentimes the dry forests are closer to sea level. And there's a mountain range to our west that is a cloud forest and the birds fly back and forth and they bring orchids and other plants that should not exist in a tropical dry forest, mm -hmm. but they do. And so you end up with this blend of cloud forest plants because of the birds. And as you walk along this ridge line, there are orchids in all the trees. We have a native kind of vanilla and it's at Oriental Agua, and we've built an orchid sanctuary. And that is because of the, the bioregional patterning of the birds going from that cloud forest that's really not very far away. It's you know, 10 kilometers across a really deep valley um, through a, a big river to the other side to our west. The birds have no problem flying back and forth during the day. And so there's really strong coupling ecologically between these two ecotypes to create a new ecotype. 
that you can experience by walking the mile and a, the hour and a half to Orihandalagua. And of course, it's filled with fossils from the ancient sea floor. You know, it's like this yeah. profoundly Andean um, types of rocks. And so to walk it is to gradually become intimate with these very subtle and very important characteristics of the, the personality of this place. What makes this place unique includes those relationships with the birds. And from up there, it's much easier to experience than in other parts of the landscape where it's more obscure. And so um, there's something about walking it regularly, like walking it as a pedagogical practice mm. that completely changes what Oregon de Lagua is. It's not a 3.2 hectare reforestation project, even though every word in that sentence is true. It's also a connection to several territorial patterns that converge on this ridgeline that you can experience as you walk. And then really fall in love with how special the place is, the way that you would fall in love with the body of your lover. Here's where my lover has this mole. Here's this you know, erotic zone where they like to be caressed. Here's a place where they were abused and I give them love for the shame they experience in it. You know, the intimacy, <laughs> the intimacy that's so important, which I know is what you're pointing to is this, this way of relating that really is slow. You like, take the time to care. You take the time to care. And, and so, you, yeah. And you can't, you can't speed it up. Like you can't use the tuk-tuk. Uh, um, it just doesn't work that way. And uh, I, I find that the, the, that bioregional learning is in part a letting oneself in this globally accelerated culture where it's so easy to jump on a Zoom call and be anywhere with anybody. Um, to practice the analog, to do what Gary, Gary Snyder referred to in, in his reinhabitation speech. Hello, I'm on Zoom. <laughs> and, um, and really, it takes this kind of, I'm being kissed by my daughter, that's nice. Love oh. you. Do you want to say hello to Joe? Come, show, show you Joe. Hello. Unfortunately, Elise is not here right now because she would love to meet you. Hi. Yeah, that's Joe. Oh, gosh. Wait, just... are you seven yet or are you still six? How old are you now? Not even six yet, are you? You're not even six yet? You're five? What? No. Gosh, you look so big. I thought you were seven. Yeah, she's huge. Mwah. Wow. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a little bit six. <laughs> the time is lost. Yeah? That's no problem. way. Oh my gosh. I can't find it. Can't well, find I'm going to show you this. Look at this. Because I only decided to draw a person with aquamarine hair. Beautiful. Do you like the color of that hair? Nice drawing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought you would approve. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, always good to come into the analog. That's where we were. Uh, like, it, it's just so important to, like, I, I've noticed, I mean, just as you were describing the kind of intimacy with place, um, it works even on smaller scale. Like, I'm taking care of half a hectare. Uh, um, but by walking that paseito every morning, that, that means, let me just close it up. <laughs> I, I can close it, but she can. You found it. Okay, there we go. Yes. There's, we, we found I, it. I don't think this works in the Whoa. country. It's a pram that we got from the neighbors. It's a recycled pram. Wow, that's so <laughs> nice. I love it. Anyway. Um, yeah, where were we? Um, I, I just so you're talking about that walking around the little yeah um, the little they, they basically there were probably about a, like we I looked at it with a friend who's a, a botanist and she helped me kind of understand who was already here when we were invited to become custodians and um and then like there were probably about 150 brushes uh, bushes and, and 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 plants and probably about 55 different species that 
that we identified. And, and now there's uh, over 400. And it's like a community that every day I, I walk and I see them. And if I didn't do that, they wouldn't be um, in the same good health. Like just before we went on, on this call, I went back down again because right now I have Harlequin ladybirds, which uh, first I thought, oh, nice ladybirds. And then I realized Harlequin ladybirds are not so nice. They, they really eat every leaf they can possibly get their claws in. Yeah? And so because I don't like spraying stuff, I have to pick them off hand by hand. Uh -huh. um, but it it creates an intimacy with place and, and like soil building, understanding the different seasons. That's why you can also the learning process, like a bioregional learning journey needs to, it can't be, and this is the danger again, but common land I think is in danger of doing things wrong. And it's actually with the same people who, kind of took on the weaving and then added bioregional it. And now they're doing bioregional weaving labs with common land, um, but still a little bit under the, here's an event, we're bringing everybody together, like the Ashoka type style, like let's bring everybody together, have a facilitated event, love each other, um, generate a lot of um, collectively generated intelligence, and then somebody capitalizes on doing something with it. Uh, uh, I. I don't think that works. Like we need we need a community who is really committed to place, already, as you said, in love with the place, to be resourced to deepen that love, to deepen that understanding. And um, I have a really good example of this. There's a woman named Gwen that we met who lives in Carbondale, Colorado. Carbondale is in the Roaring Fork River Valley. And um, just for reference, the town of Aspen is in the same valley, a little bit higher up in the Rockies. Mm -hmm. And Aspen is the wealthiest town in the United States, yeah. like where, they, where the billionaires put their little ski resort houses. And, um, and the Roaring Fork River is, being in the Western slopes of the Rockies, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just gorgeous. And there's a big mountain there called Mount Soparis, which the indigenous people, the, the Ute people, um, since time memorial, this has been one of their Mecca places is to go to this mountain. And um, this woman, Gwen, who we're, we're helping Gwen by giving her models like the common land model or more, more accurately, I think, integrated landscape management uh, as, as a language, mm -hmm. even more than the common land model specifically. Um, and she is someone who has lived in this place for decades she has teenage children she's raised there. She does very deep ritual practices with her kids. Like on the full moon, they go out full moon sledding in the winter and they have specific places they go and they've gone since the kids were little. She's just deeply, deeply, like you would cause a scar to tear her away from the landscape. She's so much a part of it and she loves it so much. And she's done a lot of work in the local food system convening people and doing this, the real social weaving work. She's done that for 12 or 13 years that I know of, maybe even longer. What she's told me about is at least that long. But she doesn't have the financial support to be able to relax into a landscape scale process. To say, okay, I could convene, I, you know, I could work with a team, she's part of a team. We could convene a series of dialogues over the next two years to really figure out what people care about, but she's too stressed about the need to make money to be able to relax into just being of service. Like if she was liberated from money, she would do it. Mm. She would just do it. And to find those people who are deeply, deeply devoted, and then to create the configuration of social support, institutional connections and financial support in alignment with the deep purpose of the landscape is that's the magic, is figuring out who those people are. Like when I started looking at the, the landscape partnerships of common land, I started realizing that it's not a job title and no one can ever apply for that position. There are very few people who would actually even want to live that way. And the thing is they're already living that way now and are deeply frustrated by the incongruence of their passion and the economic realities they live in. As is, that's, those people are, are the, you know, when you know what to look for in the heart space of a person, you enter into a community and you very quickly see, if you know how to look, wow, this woman, Gwen, 
she has sacrificed so much in service to this community and this landscape. You know, she is head over heels in love, completely devoted to this landscape, but is not supported to do what she could do in service to that devotion. Mm. And, you know, this is this is one of those, um, you sort of re- reverse the story. It's instead of there is a role that this community needs, let's create it in the community. And it's more, there are devotional people in this community that are currently invisible, and they need to be supported in the right or relationship to the landscape. Mm-hmm. Super. Yeah, that's it. That, and uh, it's really it, profound. Again, it's it's it resonates so strongly, even like because like you know when we talk about regeneration, there's also a whole bunch of people who who have a slight tendency to claim that it originated with Kara Samford and it's all the gospel of the Regenesis group and so on. But it, I don't say that in a negative way at all because there there is such deep wisdom. Yeah, they do beautiful work, of course. And yeah. and yeah. and it is based on real understanding of how life works and how to intervene not with a prediction and control mindset, but with a unveiling and um and 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 letting people share the gifts that are innate and unique to them with community and life in a place-based context and paying attention to what we're saying funding the process rather than the 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 project or the outcome these are core things about regeneration and and that's also like it's the, the 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 concept of we're not building utopias i think this is so important i i realized this in my discourse about regenerative cultures how many people picked up regenerative cultures as this oh that sounds like a great thing i think we should have one of those uh-huh. and, <laughs> and 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 then they go into the same same thing can you give me the 10 step plan to get there and let's define the vision and instead of saying no 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 um regeneration is life's innate pattern of self-organization it's the essence of self-organization and life creating conditions conducive to life it's life's evolutionary impulse to diversify and reintegrate diversity at higher level of complexity through integrative collaborative systems enhancing mechanisms and um when we do that, then it's it so much more is, and that this is that this is the the regenesis and Kara Sanford term, um, an unveiling, and making visible, and and what you were speaking to with this lady is exactly that. The the the, the healers are already there doing their work. The, the the yes, we live in a fragmented society where people take on roles, but even that is part of this narrative. And I like the way you framed that earlier, saying it does sometimes take the view of the outsider to make people realize what they've got and and one of the caveats of re-inhabitation and deep grounding in a place is that eventually you lose the ability to see the system from the outside because you become part of it and i have a somewhat comical example of that where i have this this couple that's that's here in barichara they're andres and sandy and they're just beautiful people they have beautiful children and sandy is a very attractive woman she's just beautiful and physically and emotionally and everything and there was one day we were having a gathering at our house i even think it was my birthday party and there was a moment where i took a picture of everyone dancing and she does yoga and she was doing this stretch pose and and I just took a picture and realized she just looked like gorgeous in this photo. So what I did is I showed it to Andres, who's the husband. And they have like three kids together. And I just said, wow, look at Sandy. Mm-hmm. And I could tell that he was remembering how beautiful she is. And of course, he knows her intimately and loves her. And it's not like he didn't think she was beautiful. Mm-hmm. But I was just, And I wasn't even looking at her like I was, you know, attracted to her. I just, just took this picture. like, look at this picture of Sandy. She looks so pretty. And I saw him being like, damn, she's hot. Oh, wait, she's my wife. And there's this little <laughs> moment of him, you know, remembering something he has. Yeah. And there's something about um, how we get caught up in the, the doldrum. You know, there's the, the, the everyday busyness of life 
And we don't do things like go to the local museum to learn about the local place. Or, but then a friend from out of town comes and we take them and yeah. then realize how great it is. Yeah. It's, it's like I, I always do these wonderful excursions into the history and place sourced um, story of Mallorca when people come and visit because you haven't, I mean, there's some places that I love taking people to it just because they're special but but i always discover new places through the eye of the visitor um that's really powerful yeah no i mean i think but that's part of what our role is to both whether it's with our partners in our community or whether it's with our place um or with this planet or with life itself to i'd love to tell um, each other of the gift yeah sorry yeah i'd love to tell two little stories about this one is the role of the expert, which, you know, we tend to, in, in today's um, world, there tends to be a lot of criticism of experts, which is unfortunate because experts are really needed. They just, they have their place and it's not every place. But when, when I arrived in Barichara, I had a particular, very specific specialization, which is I studied cloud formation as an atmospheric physicist. And then I went on to generally not use that knowledge. You know, I got a master's degree in atmospheric science and generally have not used that knowledge in my work. But when I got to Barichara, I remember the first week I'm standing in Bio Parque Moncora, this beautiful reforestation project. It's up on the plateau overlooking a vista that is epically gorgeous. You've seen pictures I've taken from there. It's just so beautiful there. But I started to notice the weather patterns and how clouds form. And I started to see the holistic climate system because I'd studied cloud formation. And so it was, it was a unique moment of harmony between very specialized expertise and a context that really needed that expertise. Now this pattern that was completely visible to me because of what I had studied, that was mostly invisible to everyone else because they hadn't studied it. And there was a role of that expertise to help organize the conversation. Mm. And so there's that that piece. I want to just tell that little story to say I, I didn't come here because I have the expertise to bring to the community. There was none of that neo-colonialism. Mm -hmm. I just stood there and looked at this beautiful view and realized there were clouds on the perimeter of the sky along the horizon in every direction and blue sky overhead. And it was because of the urban heat island effect, except it wasn't urban. It was deforestation creating this uh, exposed red clay that becomes like concrete, and that that was pushing the clouds to the perimeter of the climate system and causing desertification. So it's a particular pattern that is fundamental to regenerating this territory that I had a unique or very uncommon expertise to be able to see the role of cloud formation. And so I want to tell that story. And then the other story I wanted to tell was of Bio Parque Moncora. It's a six and a half hectare project. It's the most inspiring regeneration story in the territory because there's an association called Aki Leopada that has 40 members. It's mostly rich, you know, wealthier land owning families, mm -hmm. all local, but wealthy. Um, and they had this piece of land right on the top of the town that they were going to build 60 houses. Like, wow, we can make a lot of money and build houses. And about half of the members were really upset about this idea. And this was a piece of land that is very degraded after intensive monoculture agriculture for 70 or 80 years. It's basically a desert in its degradation. And because of the history of fighting and violence, when the members of the association started arguing, should we build houses, should we not? The president of the association said, okay, we're not gonna build houses, stop fighting, let's just avoid fighting. It was really an avoidance to trauma. Mm -hmm. He said, someone suggests something else. And this man named Ernesto, oh no, Alberto, this man named Alberto steps in and says, well, we could reforest it, you know? We could, we could restore the native forest there. And the president of the association just said, fine, whatever, I don't care. You know, like, just do whatever you want. Just leave me alone. Make the problem go away. So there was no support. It's not like the town came together with this beautiful vision of reforestation. It was benign neglect. Just, just do something and leave me alone and make the problem go away. So Alberto and his wife, Camila, and their friend, Vicky, 
started doing reforestation and Alberto was the only person who knew about trees. Camila and Vicky didn't, but they were you know, fully on board. Well, Alberto quickly got sick and died within four months of starting this project. Just, you know, by the, the, the synchronicities of life, he was removed from the picture as the only person who knew how to bring back the forest. And then Camila and Vicky, who knew very little, basically planting um, individual trees in a landscape like concrete. It was, it was hard packed exposed clay. So 90% of the trees died. They didn't really know what they were doing, but they just kept going back and doing it. Eventually they found the alcalde, you know, the mayor's office, had a little reforestation program. They had some native trees. They'd get some trees. Uh, Vicky is a retired singer. So she would do fundraising benefits by singing to be able to get materials for planting trees. The association that owned the land gave no financial support. It was just neglect. Fast forward from 2009 when that started to 2019 when I arrived. And there's this beautiful reforestation project that looks like a community park. You've seen some of the pictures, it's this lovely place. And Camila and Vicky still have an inferiority complex. You know, they've come to believe that no one really appreciates their work, that they're, they're sort of just doing it as a labor of love. And then I start raising money all over the world for how inspiring the story of Bio Parque Moncora is, showing Camila and Vicky how beautiful their work is. And they're not used to getting praise. They don't know how beautiful their project is. It is sort of the innocence of the outsider who comes in and says, wow, what you've done here is so amazing. The world needs to know about it. Hmm. And when we tell the world, the world's so inspired by what you've done, and they still are, are sort of surprised by how much people love the Beale Park here. It is the flagship of regeneration for the whole territory. Everyone loves it, and they still have a hard time realizing it. Yeah, it, 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 it there's a similar story here um, with, is it one corner of the island that um, is really the most remote part of the Tramontana, the mountain range that runs um, along along the sort of uh, northwest edge of Mallorca, and in, in the northwest corner, um, there's this. It's basically a, a steep valley goes up to the ridge, and then it goes down to the um, another sort of high ridge, and then down sh sharp cliffs to to the sea, and. Um, a German Colombian couple, I don't know where they made their money from it. Some like in the late 1960s came to Mallorca, fell in love with this place and had a sort of Doug Tompkins type. Um, let's just buy it and keep it as it is. And right in the middle of it, we bow, build ourselves a little house and live here ha happily ever after. And 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 they did that. But it, it's a hundred hectares. It's a massive area. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and then another parallel story is a, is a young Austrian German lady who did a PhD expert, uh, um, a PhD in raptor biology, and super pas passionate about raptor um, conservation, and obviously brilliant because she basically seemed to have had her professors sort of put a portfolio of well, there are six major keeping raptors from going extinct projects in um, Europe and North Africa, which which one of them want, do you want to work at? And and she picked um, Mallorca because of some family connection. And this was the black vulture that was down to, I think, seven breeding pairs and about 35 individuals. And it was 1970. And she started super small, like you were describing, to just do the hard work of caring for those few species they 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 did rewilding because before it was called rewilding they discovered some black vultures in in catalonia and brought them here to to strengthen the the local population and then they met these these people um with the 100 hectare estate because the natural breeding grounds of the vultures were in their estate and they had to build trust over some years, but when some 10 years ago, the 
husband died of this couple. They transferred the money, they transferred the custodianship of the 100 hectares to the foundation. And the lady still lives there in her house in, in her 90s. But but basically, it's now managed by by Evelyn and and Evelyn single handedly really with 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 her husband and and a, and, and a small team um, has saved the black vulture from extinction and the population is back um, to I think uh, over three hundred individuals and seventy breeding pairs and um, yeah it's it's those kind of sometimes and, and even although the, this is an amazing success story and it. It also has a sort of territorial scale. I mean, 100 hectares is, is already a pretty big chunk yeah, of where we could start and where we are now starting this, this concept of area under regeneration, just like you're doing, the, this working from a few strong points that already exist in the territory and networking them up into a larger landscape pattern. Yeah. Um, that's like... There's such potential of connecting funding with those existing projects, um, but it's also it's it's tricky work because money is jumpy and once like it it can it can some money can very quickly influence how things are done because people don't just give the money they in good faith want to give you their way of scaling. <laughs> like I've noticed this, I'm involved in this this wonderful group of. Donor foundations and doer foundations that I mentioned earlier, where, where Willem also uh, was initially, um, and I can see it among some of these philanthropists that have been like floated into that category of privilege by creating a unicorn in the Bay Area and think that they know how to scale because then they have scaled up a tech company to being a unicorn. And and then the obsession with scaling up rather than scaling deep or, or scaling out, um, they they then go to NGOs in Africa or the, these kind of beautiful projects and say, oh, it's wonderful what you did there. Let let me teach you how to do this everywhere and make you really big. And that that's where it, like we we need these agents like you're doing in, in the territory you're involved in. And, and I'm slowly trying to weave here is connecting international interest in bioregional scale regeneration with existing territories and the potential and story that is already there and and i think both where you are and where i am that the story that the potential is just vast and it doesn't mean that it's not going to be complicated <laughs> yeah I, I want to go in the other direction for a moment and talk about the trip we're about to take through the colorado basin because um the other thing we're discovering and we really practiced this in the eastern part of the Great Lakes in February, so we're practicing, is that there's a larger narrative of a cluster of landscapes or a cluster of bioregions, such as the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes would have multiple bioregions within it that um, creates a context in which um, a continental scale story begins to emerge. And so we're gonna do this trip where um, we already have some really good connections with two watersheds that are headwaters of the Colorado River that are in the western slopes of the Colorado Rockies, the Roaring Fork River and the North Fork of the Gunnison River. And, um, and these are places where there are local people, like the woman Gwen that I mentioned, who's in one of those landscapes, um, and the other one in the North Fork of the Gunnison River in the town of Paonia, so where there's a lot of biodynamic farming in both of these water uh, river valleys, there's a lot of community land trusts and regenerative agriculture and conservation work and you know permaculture centers and alternative elementary schools for kids to get forest learning. It's it's, it's western slopes of the Colorado Rockies. You have these amazing people, and um, and what we're starting to see is that to help those landscapes that would each be you know, half a million hectares maybe in size. You think of the watershed, the watershed level. They would definitely be common land size projects. That those stories make more sense when we connect them to their larger continental pattern. And so just like how um, if you have a sloped one hectare piece of land or even a backyard, you would start watershed restoration at the top and work your way down as the water moves through it. 
that we want to explore the story of the entire Colorado Basin from the, the Colorado Rockies to the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. So we're going to do a, we're calling it a sacred journey. And the idea is really after some rather, you know, difficult um, human interactions we've had recently with a, a particular conflict that was really difficult, we felt the desire to just connect with the earth directly and, and have a sort of spiritual atonement in a way to reconnect with what's important. And because both my partners at the design school for regenerating earth, both Benji and Penny are from Colorado, uh, and we already have some connections there. Uh, I had this idea emerge. What if we were to go from the headwaters to the Sea of Cortez just to experience the river as a being? You know, just to experience it. That would be so powerful for us. And so now we're going to travel and, and wherever people invite us to speak, we'll talk about regenerating the Colorado River, which includes the Gila River that comes out of New Mexico and across Arizona, which is the river that goes through Phoenix. And so we end up with the Colorado River, if, when people know it at all, might think of Southern Utah, they might think of the Grand Canyon, but they wouldn't think of Phoenix. Even though Phoenix with the Gila River and the couple of other rivers that come together there, they drain into the Colorado River just before Baja California. And almost none of the water gets to the Colorado River anymore. Actually, most of it goes to Mexico for uh, to either Phoenix, Tucson or Northern Mexico. Um, for agriculture. And, and so these are just terribly abused rivers, right? Isn't it also going to Lehi with the Hoover Dam? Yeah, well, well, that's the Colorado River coming right. out of the Grand Canyon into Lake Mead yeah. and then from Hoover Dam into Black Canyon. That's the Colorado River. Whereas the Gila River, which starts in New Mexico, mm -hmm. it's still on the Continental Divide, um, but it's much farther south and it's all desert landscape at that, at that um, latitude. But what's interesting is um, to tell the story of impact investors would be an interesting, like let's to go, go to the place of what would an impact investor do for some place like the Roaring Fork Valley where Carbondale is, you know, a 500,000 hectare landscape is interesting. But then it's really interesting to say, we have this 1500 mile river, the Colorado River, which doesn't even include the Green River coming out of Wisconsin or the Gila River coming out of New Mexico. It's like 8% of the continental United States. It's, it's this huge, huge area with many different landscapes in it. And I just ask, what would it mean to regenerate the Colorado River Basin? Not just the Colorado River, but the basin, which has these other major rivers in it. And to see that because the Colorado is the most famously contested river on earth, the most poorly managed river on earth from a sustainability point of view. You know, it's like, it's, it's like a cluster fuck, basically. It's like the ex textbook example of water conflict. Um, to just ask, what would it mean to dream of regenerating the Colorado Basin? Now, we don't have any uh, delusions of, of us doing something that works to regenerate the Colorado River. You know, I mean, I do believe there is a way that could work, but that's not why we're doing it. <laughs> we're doing it for our own land connection. We all feel a sacred connection to these landscapes in our own ways as individual people. And that we realize that no one is dreaming of regenerating the Colorado Basin. It just seems too impossible, you know? Like, no one's even thinking it. It's interesting. that There are people working, I know of projects in, in Asia that are of that scale with, with Asian rivers, and, and also I know of a group of people that are doing wonderful work along the entire Nile Basin, which is massive. Yeah. We were talking yeah, similar about scale, yeah. Lake, Lake yeah. Victoria all the way down to Alexandria. Uh, and like There's a big, big chunk of Africa involved here. And um, the for me, like we need to think of these patterns and places fractal. We need to work within the much smaller scale of, of re-inhabitation in a particular place. And um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I, I, I'm just wondering how more on a personal level you find, because it's, it's, it's making a decision of, am I going to, commit to the process of re-inhabitation in a given territory um, and and go through all the 
the stormy days and the sunny days in that territory, um, ultimately renouncing the the joyful opportunity that our privileged group of people have to say, I'm going to go travel and do this. Yeah? Um, because there's something to be gained from the commitment to place over long periods of time, like we were saying earlier. But then for me, I'm always tempted to, like I've just recently had some lovely people again inviting me to Mexico or to Brazil or uh, Lucia, because COVID made us break up going to, like we were going to be in Portugal for two weeks and then we had to go home. And since then, Lucia keeps saying, when are we going back to Lisbon? I want to see Portugal. Um, and yet I find in myself a very strong, like I don't really want to move from place and and how like because i'm observing you breathing in and out with barichara how how deeply are you committed to that particular project or is it i mean it's also a different position legally maybe for you um although i think you've sorted that bit of the the residency permit and all that like um, how, how do you sit with that like the the kind of because while you're doing this wonderful connecting with the colorado river you're not putting the the activating energy and the attention into the network that that you've been also helping to to gel uh, barichara yeah it's this is uh, one of those paradoxes that i find that my ability to be in barichara for the long term at least in these first three and a half years has depended upon my ability to tell a global story and connect with other landscapes and so i dance in the tension of that and what's been happening in the last six or eight months is I'm finding that to be able to stay in Barichara and to go deep and be here, I also have to answer my call to the world. And that's the paradox part of it. So um, it's, it was surprising to me. You know, when, when my marriage dissolved and I started a new relationship and the woman I'm in a relationship with is from Boulder, Colorado, and so, uh, so I went with her, I went to see her in Colorado. And then while I was there, I offered to give talks if anyone asked me. And that was the beginning of these connections to other landscapes. And then later when we were invited to the greater Toronto area and then did a tour of the Eastern Great Lakes. And now we're preparing to do something in October in Cascadia and the Salish Sea. And what I'm finding is the coherence of what I do in Barichara depends upon me going and working in these other landscapes. But it's just a, the way that it unfolds day to day in my own life. It's mm -hmm. very idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And what I'm what I'm feeling really strongly is I want to grow old in the Bioparque, actually. I like I'm doing this, I'm two years into what I call a food forest, but really it's mostly native ecological succession with a few beneficial plants. So it's more like native reforestation. But it's it's deeply spiritual for me, and I'm up to about a half acre of land that we've converted from invasive grass to increasingly embellishing native forest. You know, very early stages, of course, in that time. Oh, we're getting rid of grass, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's incredible. I find it so powerful. I love it. Like it's like <laughs> zen stick. Boom, boom. <laughs> yeah, I'm there with a pickaxe. I was there this morning. I have dirt under my fingernails from doing it this morning, but um. And the two women, like I said, Camille and Vicky, they're they're both in their mid seventies, and I can feel that there is this intergenerational secession that I could become a lifetime guardian of the Bioparque. I could be the crazy old forest man of the Bioparque, and that makes my heart smile. I would love that, and yet I'm not able to do it at this stage in my life. I, I have this tension: how often can I go to the Bioparque? And you know, because of the dynamic of my daughter and her school or other responsibilities, sometimes a few weeks go by before I can really be there. And other times I'm there every day. And and the struggle that I find is that my devotion is for the long term. And that um, for reasons that are increasingly making sense to me, I have a role in helping to catalyze these landscape patterns in North America. But doing it while living in Barichara and then traveling to those places. And I know it's of limited duration, it's for a couple of years. It's not my long-term vision of the world. I even think with 
the instabilities of the global system that it's just unclear how how affordable or how feasible or whether air travel, like we saw with COVID, does air travel get shut down? Yeah, whatever. It's we can't really predict any of those things. It's too know, I don't know what it's called in, in English. Um this is is a children's game where you put a bunch of chairs in the middle of the room or whatever, facing outwards in a circle or something. And then you play music and the kids run around the chairs and, uh, yeah. and there's one, one chair less than there's children. And when the music stops, you you um, you have to sit down. Uh -huh. Yeah, we call it musical chairs. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, like in, 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 in to some extent, it's like with the global traveling, like when it all comes tumbling down, where will we be at? Um, but uh, maybe the signs will be readable enough that, that you make sure you get back to Biopaki before, before that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm doing my best. And what's interesting is like Cascadia, I've lived a third of my life between Seattle and Eugene. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love that part of the planet. That was the first place that felt like home to me. It's interesting that the first time Missouri felt like home to me was when I went there in December a few months ago. And I was bringing in this landscape bioregional lens. Of course, now, now I know about the Bioregional Congress of the Ozarks and, you know, that I actually grew up in a very bioregional culture mm -hmm. without appreciating it as a child. Um, but uh, taking my daughter to visit my family and going to see caves and experiencing the Ozark Plateau, I love that landscape in a way that I could not have loved when I was a kid. And I know you've talked about that tension in your own life with, with Munich. And, you have a um, with David Hankey again, like, you know, when, when you were there, there, there was this possibility that you were going to see David Hankey. Um, did you did you speak with him? We had an email exchange, and really, I dropped the ball. He was very keen to meet, and I was just too busy, and even I, after I reached out to him. So I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> he's a lovely man. He's a lovely man, and and there's a lot yeah. to learn from the 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 way that they were organizing the first North American Bioregional Congress with snail mail, like a bunch of like yeah. the, they were real activists, and it wasn't like um, the kind of way that we can connect yeah. people now but yeah, yeah. It, it, just briefly two things i think i mentioned one of them some on some channel to you already but just so it's on on your radar um with regard to the colorado river story there are two beautiful like the, one person to connect with is andy lipkis from three people in la um because he's always had this dream of bringing the salmon back into the la river which is ultimately also um linked to that watershed and and they they did a with another friend and mentor of mine Gigi Coyle from the School of Lost Borders who lives or until recently had a main base in in the Owens Valley um, near Three Creeks um, and, and near, near um, Bishop Big Pine um, and they did something if you google it you can probably find it it's called walking water and it's a beautiful pilgrimage where they walked the Owens Valley to raise awareness around the way that the Owens Valley has basically been drained for LA. Uh, and um, the, again, the, the the level of indigenous connection that they managed to connect into this walking water pilgrimage um, initiative, I think you, you might find it quite inspiring for your 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 plans with yeah. the well, one thing that's nice is I have a friend named Eduardo Esparza, who is from Baja, California. He's Mexican. And um, and he's now helping, he's working with impact funds and trying to support large-scale regenerative projects. Actually, his family lives in Atlanta now, so he's one of those, you know, weird global citizens. <laughs> but he's deeply connected to his childhood in, in Mexicali. And so he just yesterday he asked me if I could make a 10 minute video about our journey in the Colorado Basin in Spanish for him to share with key people, including the indigenous tribe that's there at the mouth of the Colorado River. So we we even though we came up with it, we we decided to do this five days ago and we're doing it two weeks from now. So it's highly improvisational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like we're planning something really strategic. And, and still, we may have an invitation from the indigenous people at the mouth of the of the Colorado River that it materializes in the next week to receive us at the end of our journey, just to show how how ready people are for this kind of a story. And obviously, to arrive to an indigenous group we've never met, 
would be the very, very beginning of a relationship. But symbolically, to say we're we're going to bring gift offerings from the headwaters of the Colorado to the Sea of Cortez mm. to do the the opposite of what the like the Kogi people here in Colombia. Um, they bring gift offerings, or what they call pagamentos. They bring them from the bottom of the river to the top of the mountains. Mm. And we're going to reverse that course. But the story we're going to tell is, if people want to regenerate the Colorado, they need to start by focusing on the headwaters. You begin the regeneration at the top and work your way down. And, um, and then with local people in the headwaters, help them to tell a story of creating a Colorado Basin Summit where they would say, to regenerate the Colorado, let's gather people in the headwaters. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be part of the story we'll be telling. So even though we're throwing it together at the, with almost no time, and half of it is for us to just connect with the land ourselves, and any other benefit is vicarious. We've already been, we have confirmed speaking events in three of the headwaters, and a fourth one that'll probably happen soon. We have another confirmed speaking opportunity in the Sonora Desert, outside of Phoenix, with a group called Regenerate Sonora, which is taking a bioregional approach. And we're five days in. So something interesting will come of it. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> and either way, it's going to be an amazing, like as a spiritual journey for us, it's, I think it's going to change our lives. And the Colorado River is so abused and so beautiful that I just can't imagine, you know, how could we not come away transformed by this? Well, if you... If you walk it, then you'll definitely, but that'll take some time. Yeah, which of course we don't have capacity for at the moment. It'll be a two week road trip, basically. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> pick and choose your 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 level of utopia, as you said. <laughs> well, one, one, wonderful that, that you did. <laughs> and it's, a, it's it, it, also what you were saying earlier with regard to using these journeys as a as a way of for the local people to connect the fractalness of place um like i mean you were speaking about barichara and how the edge effect between two ecotones meeting creating that 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 diversity that um is special is also an example of how how boundaries are fluid like uh, and we need to be able to breathe in and out with those bioregional boundary definitions and even the watershed some regions are defined by the, like what, what Carol Sanford calls a life shed, like in the sense that it, water is a wonderful way into it, but the the cultural story and the landscape and the pattern story that has evolved goes beyond the river. It goes into overlapping forest systems and altitude and all, all those, those other elements. And I, I noticed this with regard to what, what I feel is part of the unlocking of the potential here on Mallorca. For a long time, I was very focused on Mallorca. Um, I was kind of aware that Mallorca was interestingly part of a cluster of islands that um, had this sort of fractal scale scale linkingness to it, because there's like Fomentera, which is tiny, then there's Ibiza, which is a bit bigger, then there's Menorca, and then there's Mallorca. And they kind of go up almost in a sort of powers of 10. Eh? And um, what happened when I, like part of this this thing that Common Line is now involved in here on Mallorca is the buy-in happened through making people understand that our uniqueness is the connection of terrestrial ecosystems restoration to marine ecosystems restoration and how the, the story or what you were calling continental scale patterns uh, here that the bigger pattern is really the Balearic Islands as a biodiversity hotspot in the Western Mediterranean. And how do we keep this sea alive by regenerating the islands? Because the, the main yeah. effect on the marine impact is through what is happening on the islands. And also similar to what you were talking earlier about the the um your your background in in atmospheric physics and, and and cloud formation um we have a similar thing here that that the island has been the islands have been denuded to like when maybe not that long ago 70 80 years 
there was such a need to provide food and livelihood from a relatively harsh environment in the summer that there wasn't a spot that wasn't somehow cultivated. Like the old Mallorcans said, Mallorca, um, uh, a forest garden, basically. Uh, everything was growing food somewhere. And then it became cheap to import the food and 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 the whole concept of sequia, like dry land, suddenly came up and stuff was left left behind. And that meant that the biotic pumps, uh, pumps stopped working because basically we get this, if, this the same kind of effect that the land heats up and it draws in wind, which we get a little bit of dew moisture from in the mornings, but but ultimately it creates a conditions where when there are clouds, they, they actually skewed around this territory because there's this heat chimney that pushes the moisture away. It, the, the, the way that yeah. these clouds would rain down on Mallorca is if we stop that heat chimney and we generate some biotic pump micro cycles of um, the, the local hydrology, that the mo when moisture meets moisture, the rain falls. Yeah, and um, yeah. so, so it, it's these these connecting patterns, this this wider story of place, and and this unique embeddedness here in both the like the tuna that half half of the world eats spawns in the Balearic Sea. Yeah, um, yeah. there are yeah. massive patterns of connection. Well, one thing I found when we're in the Great Lakes, and that we're definitely going to be. Uh, um, encouraging this narrative linkage when we go to Cascadia is um, people have a, a difficult time seeing how local action is empowering for global problems. But that's partly because they don't understand the Earth system. Like if they understood some of the larger patterns, like the ones you were just describing about the biotic pump and the, the wind patterns across the Mediterranean, which is a larger scale, like when in atmospheric science would be a meso scale or you know, tens to hundreds of kilometers scale phenomenon, maybe connected with the Hadley cells and you know, the intertropical convergence zone of the Tropic of Cancer, these, these what are more planetary scale or regional scale phenomena in terms of the climate system, then that shows the leverage of the scale link. To go back to Stuart Cowan's insights about, about scale linking. Like I was really intrigued when I, I found a video recently, a couple, maybe a month or so ago, uh, that the person who advocated for the Salish Sea to be called the Salish Sea, you know, to rename it in the indigenous name, was an oceanographer. And he was an oceanographer because the Salish Sea is defined, more or less, as a physical system at least, because of the amount of fresh water that mixes into the Salish Sea that is connected with the salmon habitats. Mm -hmm. You know, the, sa the salmon live so well in that marine ecosystem because the salinity is lower and it's lower because like the Fraser River, that's the river that goes through Vancouver, British Columbia, provides half of the fresh water to the Salish Sea. And it's a huge amount of fresh water that's mixing in. And there's this sal salinity mixing process that defines the Salish Sea which means it's completely invisible to human eyes. Mm. You know, you have to understand that freshwater, seawater mixing process to understand what makes that inland, you know, the fjords and the other aspects that are more like Norway, why are they not the Salish Sea? And it has to do with the freshwater mixing in the salmon, which a marine biologist or an oceanographer might know, but most people wouldn't. Or maybe a fisherman would know because they're following the fish populations going around. It was just really interesting to see that the entire economy of that region and the potlatch culture that came out of it was all profoundly connected to salmon, which means it was profoundly connected to freshwater, ocean water mixing. Mm -hmm. And that that the, the scientific component, the saying, wow, this is actually a, a continental scale process of, uh, of ocean currents, atmospheric patterns, rivers, snowpack and snow melt, the salmon runs all together, which is this earth system phenomenon. That's what makes it the Salish Sea <laughs> in, a, a, in a physical sense. And- um, yeah, but, but the interesting thing is like, I, I completely hear you um, also <laughs> like for me, 
studying oceanography was one of the the, the early windows into a holistic earth system science. Um, like I, I remember I was still doing my undergraduate work in zoology and biology at Edinburgh. And, and because I was starting to get annoyed with the kind of um, p-value obsession of ethologists at the time, and you couldn't talk about animal behavior if you couldn't crunch it into statistical data, I, I, I was looking for courses that gave me an exit to, to do less of that. And 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 I did oceanography and, and it really changed. Like I remember that I had this beautiful textbook that the first bit of the textbook was somebody starting a warp, an expedition in New York and walking across the Atlantic, scaling the mid-Atlantic ridge and then down again to make it to England. And it was as if like talking about the bathymetry and what they would encounter in the the Atlantic Ocean, as if there wasn't any water in it, um, and it was told as a fictional story of we are doing this, this expedition, and it just had a beautiful way of of bringing you into this marine environment, um, and and it was a very non scientific storytelling approach for a scientific textbook, and and that's where I was going with this. It's like on the one hand, these these scientifically told stories are really powerful, but when you said that's what makes the Salish Sea the Salish Sea, there was a brief moment of uh, saying, yes, but the human inhabitants of that place as expressions of place, not through the analytical thinking mind, but through the embodied sensing, feeling, intuiting of being place, of not being owners of territory, but being expression of place had an awareness of all of that that wasn't scientifically corroborated, explained, and all of that. But they knew how to be custodians without being aware of those patterns. And they yeah. knew about the importance of freshwater and saltwater meeting and the salmon without knowing all the physics and knowing all the, the atmospheric science. And, and how do we when we when we tell these stories and create these stories, because it, I mean, it's a wonderful way in, and it gets a lot of people excited, and 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 you tell these stories beautifully, but I, I'm sure that you're also aware of the 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 the, the importance of the kind of non scientific narratives of territory that that actually, in a much more ancient way, um, express how people have understood the place when they were still truly part of when they were still inhabitory people uh, inhabitory people rather than, yeah. than tourists uh, I, I completely agree with your impulse to be like wait a second <laughs> um, and and what what's powerful about it for me is because I think part of my strength is that I'm something like a poet in the way that I think and feel and experience the world and I'm also very scientific in my training and understanding and so I go back and forth between the two in the way I tell stories um yeah. what's yeah yeah which is like that's just part of my personality and uh, and what i love about it is when we talk about doing regenerative work like how would we design for how would we intend for the restoration of these living systems that um the scientific part of the story is something i can bring in and say well you know i hope that an indigenous person will speak about this other part or maybe they're present in the room i will speak about the scientific part to bring the connection that we can actually use these processes in our design thinking. And then I'm sort of bringing the credibility of the scientific lens as part of the storytelling. But then what's really powerful is the local people who know the local culture really well. And they validate what I said culturally, not scientifically. You know, maybe they also know it scientifically, but that's not the, really the point. If they will say, and this is why the indigenous people value the symbolism of this. This is a mythic narrative of our people, whichever element they bring in, which I'm I'm very happy to say is not my role because I'm the outsider if I'm the one telling that story. <laughs> you know, I'm coming as, it's like, let me help you see your place differently, but now listen to your local storytellers differently as well. Right. Um, because what you're saying is absolutely right. <laughs> you know, because I'm also very much in that same space of, of trying to, do the science in this in the tradition of Brian's women Thomas Berry? Like um how how can science make us reconnect with the awe-inspiring magnificent of 
who we actually are when we stop looking at the world through this subject object separation um, individual species individuals narrative and we realize that life is a planetary process and and we're all just a blimp in it but as Satish Kumar in a conversation I had with him at the beginning of the year beautifully said like is it then Daniel looks like we're, we're all just contributories to a larger ri river uh, um, and it's but that is what what we contribute makes a difference. It, it does change the course of the river. So each and every one of us counts. Um, and for me, like the the what was going with this with the um, ah, I lost my thread unfortunately. Um, when you were describing, hold on, I'll I'll get it back. Um, was it more to the local storyteller or was it something else? Ah, mm. uh, it's gone. It's gone. It was it was something about um, how science is just magnificent in the way that it 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 connects us in into things. Um, and it's yeah. Anyway, it's gone unfortunately. But I'm also realizing that we're we're running close to um, making this a two hour conversation, and um, I don't need to tell you that that um, will only the most hardened. Uh, listeners will sit through um, two hours of us, uh, but maybe some people have managed to get to this point. Um, wow. But let, let's do another one relatively soon um, to to continue the conversation. Like when you maybe when you come back, because um, it's it's really nourishing to hear your your journey because it's it's a parallel journey, and and I would I would love to. Um, there's so many other th themes that we haven't touched on. Uh, um, like just to open up a, a cliffhanger for people, yeah? the the um, the pitfalls and dangers and the pros and cons of how to do territorial work and how sometimes it's good to gel people around a kind of narrative of here's a big story and we are doing or some strong character saying, I am doing and join me. Yeah? And then this, this more subtle um, social acupuncture that, that almost tries to start from the very beginning to be invisible, to be almost subliminal in the sense that, that if more people local people start to align with what life wants to do in that place and give voice to it then the job is done and 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 you and and you celebrate it and and, and step away or become one of the local people to do exactly that but 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 it, like the 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 being able to weave people together resource people through funding and all of that and remain as invisible as possible. And it's not easy because, I mean, one of the routes to funding is to create that individual that people trust or believe in or whatever, and that brings in the funding. And And I, I think that we could have a really interesting conversation about this because, um, like, I've, I've seen you take one particular strategy and, and I've, here on Mallorca, tried the hardest not to put out something to the world of saying, I'm doing a project here on Mallorca. Um, and 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 I think both of them have value. But I, 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 if we open that one now, um, no, we, I think that, uh, I think that is a beautiful, yeah. it's a beautiful teaser for another conversation. Yeah. And you know, one thing I want to say, um, just to maybe I'd say this way: the people who would get to this part of the conversation would stay all the way to the end, yeah. are people who love you and who love me, and who have wanted to to be a fly on the wall when we talk. And I think it's so important to just recognize that you and I have a, a strange and interesting friendship and that, um, that we, could, we could work on um, helping to understand and explain what, what our friendship is. Because um, there, there have definitely been times where people, like I, I would get annoyed by how many people would say, do you know Daniel Christian Ball? And I'm like, yes, I do. Please stop, I know him. You know, like, like they associate us in a way that's actually really lovely. Um, and uh, and I think that a lot of our strength in the last few years 
has been that we've been doing things relatively separately. We don't need to do them together. And so there's this sense of um, something beautiful on the field that um, I just wanted to, to have a moment of giving energy to it, but not to try to name it. Just to recognize that there's something there. It's been a and, lot you know, and it's really important, whatever it is. I mean, the, the, the journey that is just that I remember when David Hodgson put us together because basically he said, oh, you've just written this book about designing regenerative cultures. Don't don't you know Joe Brewer? He's talking about culture design all the time. And then, and I remember when when we first at this um, this call initiated by him, um, there was this because I wasn't in the space that you were in of of having understood the power of social media to communicate new ways of thinking and, and do basically um, meta design, um, new mental scaffolding that the stuff that the, the rules that you work with that that so brilliantly sometimes said to, to, to like the work that you've done with Lakoff, like making people aware of linguistic framing and the power of narrative and and, and all of that in um, and and I think that was. Like at the time, there was for me the sense that you didn't really see me because I didn't have 20,000 followers on Medium. And you were somewhat like, who is this dude? He's telling me that he's just written a book and he wants me to buy it and read it because he believes it might be interesting. And 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 then somehow, like we, we're now doing very similar things on regenerative cultures and regenerative territorial work in, in, in different ways where... We use the the strings that ha we have on each other's harp, or on, on our own harp from all the because we all have done like both of us have done very different things and and integrate a lot of not just science and as you're saying the kind of poetry and the scientist the the the, the embodied practitioner and um, the the theoretician and the, the big picture thinker uh -huh. and yeah I I think it'd be really nice to to have another one of, of also um, another cliffhanger is we didn't get to that because it, I didn't want to drop into that space, but it would be a nice one to like the, the darker side, the shadows, the the uh, dealing with depression in this world, the, yeah. Like how do we face collapse? Like, let's have, an, let's have another conversation. I think we've given enough to yeah. for people. to. No, I actually think we, we should have that conversation because that's where some of the most beautiful secrets lay hidden. And they lay hidden simply because it's territory that doesn't get explored, well, at least not publicly. You know, it doesn't get explored publicly with any regularity. But like my struggle with suicide and depression is why I can hold so much difficulty now. It was like training in a quoted way. You know, like not that I would say, go and train in depression. It's like, oh, if you have managed, if you've learned how to manage depression, you can handle certain kinds of hardship. And that actually is a real strength. That's sort of an Achilles heel sort of strength that if it hasn't hurt you, it keeps you strong. Um, but I think there's something about the various dimensions of like how I draw conflict to me at certain moments in my process and seem to be a problematic person. And in some ways I am a problematic person. And how is that both a strength and a weakness? And what does it mean to hold the paradoxes of, of uh, depression and hope? And um, yes, let's and, have, uh, let's have yeah, a like, it just be so beautiful. <laughs> right. So you're probably busy with your with your pilgrimage, um, but get in touch when you when you had the pilgrimage settle in you and maybe some whatever it is in a couple of months time, and let's let's have another conversation and safe travels and and onward, brother. <laughs> yeah, onward, brother, and I want to hang out with your daughter more. Gosh, yes. I just love kids. Well, okay. You need you need to do one of your your pilgrimages to the Mediterranean at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Penny and I were just talking the other day, like, huh, should we go visit Daniel in Mallorca just because it'd be cool to hang out with him and because Mallorca, I've seen pictures. It looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, it has that has that. Oh, uh, I might as well stay here, particularly for people who've <laughs> a lot of places and want to kind of get an anchor. But anyway. Um, so lovely to be in. I'd love to, yeah, do come. There's, there's a caravan waiting for you. Um, it, it's always ready. Uh, so, um, and also love to see Penny and, and bring your daughter and um, safe travels and lots of love. Thank you, Daniel. Talk Great. to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.